happy Wednesday, everybody. Make sure we're getting everything set up here. Um, hopefully you guys have had a good week and have enjoyed uh, just this really pretty last few days of summer. A little bit of rain, but overall um, a good opportunity for us to be able to get outside and enjoy some time together. Um, great Sunday this past week. So we continued in our created series and looked at the topic of uh, God's creation of Adam and looked at what that has to do um, with us today, especially pertaining to Father's Day and and God's design for manhood. This next Sunday, we'll continue in that same vein of thought. We'll look at the creation of Eve specifically and look at what the Bible says about uh, God's design and purpose for, for women. And I think uh, ladies will be really a uh, helpful time and men as well for us to be able to jump into that together. And um, so it's this Sunday, 930 and 11. Don't forget, okay, clapping for effort into the microphone. All right, so uh, don't forget Sunday night at 5 o'clock is our next family table, okay? So we're opening this up to the whole church. Uh, we're not going to do registration. We're not going to do like capping a certain amount. We hope everyone can come on Sunday evening. We're doing kind of like a light finger food style potluck, so bring something easy. Uh, we might not have that many uh, enough tables set up for everybody. So we want people to be able to sit kind of in the, if they need to, in the rows in the auditorium and things like that, so it won't be too messy, but it's kind of some finger food style stuff or dessert, whatever you'd like to bring for that. And then uh, starting about 5.30, we're going to jump into a really powerful uh, time of worship together. Our worship team has been working uh, for the past several weeks. They've been getting home on Wednesday evenings. They usually practice, um, you know, past couple weeks, 9, 10 o'clock while they've been, you know, working diligently to put this uh, night of worship on. I know it's going to be awesome and I know it's going to be a blessing. And uh, I'm really looking forward to being there myself and our family. So don't miss this Sunday night. Okay, put on your calendars. I've never come to one of these before. Make this your first one. Okay, come out Sunday evening, 5 o'clock. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start there with the finger foods. We're going to enjoy some time of fellowship together. Um, then we're going to jump into time of worship. Following, we're planning right now. Um, we're hoping to be able to have maybe a, a couple of fire pits outside following, do some s'mores, maybe continue that time of worship after the service as well, and just give us an opportunity to be together and to worship our God as a church family. And so I'm really, really looking forward to that. I hope you can come this Sunday, 5 p.m., okay? Also on Sunday, we have the uh, missionary family, uh, the Stokes family to Vanuatu are going to be with us uh, on Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Sunday morning, they're going to get up, uh, Seth is, and and talk a little bit about um, their ministry there in Vanuatu. And then he's going to be teaching uh, in our junior church class in the 11 o'clock service. So if you got kiddos, it'll be a great opportunity for you to be able to hear from, from them. And then they'll be back, I believe, Sunday night as well. If you have teenagers, they're going to be at a Bible study um, that um, the Sobek family puts on for uh, area teenagers on Saturday night. And if you'd like more information on that, um, comment below or reach out to Justin or myself. We can get you in touch with Adam because uh, they'll have a time of, of games and stuff over at their home. And then uh, and then uh, Seth will uh, speak there. So really exciting weekend. I want to make sure that you know everything that's happening so you can be involved in everything. Okay, so Stokes family, Sunday morning and Sunday evening, and then family table worship night at 5 p.m. Sunday night. Okay, I know it takes a little bit more effort to come out to church twice in one day, but I know you can do it. Okay, so we look forward to seeing you there Sunday night at 5 o'clock. Also, this past Sunday, we talked for the first time about Vacation Bible School, which is coming up less than a month away at this point. If you'd like to volunteer uh, to serve in that, Pastor Justin's going to put a link below uh, in the comments where you can sign up there to be able to uh, volunteer and serve and um, fill that out so we can make sure we have enough workers to be able to do everything. And um, we've tried to, I know we're maybe getting started a little bit later this year in, in prep and things like that. It seems like it's, it's right around the corner, but we wanted to make sure that you know, with the COVID things like that, that we, you know, uh, were able to do it and do it well. So it will take place July 19th to 23rd, starting each night, I think at 6 p.m. And uh, we'll talk more about that for the kids coming up. But workers, we need you to sign up. So uh, Justin, put that link in if you haven't already. And then we'll get a, uh, a form of your information so we can follow up with you guys and, and get talk talking about all the different ways we can serve in this. So, well, we're going to continue um, two more weeks in our story of David. And um, tonight we're going to continue that as well. So uh, if you do have a Bible with you, we're going to start in 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16. Let me get my stuff open here. Too far. There we go. 
So 2 Samuel chapter 16. And um, we're going to talk tonight about the topic of forgiveness. Of forgiveness. Um, I don't know if there's three words that hold more power than I forgive you. Uh, there's a lot of meaning packed there. Uh, there's a lot of healing packed in those three words of, of I forgive you. Uh, freely given, those words commend a marriage. They commend a friendship. They can breathe life into a, a broken relationship. They can be kind of like the first rays of hope into a very dark situation, maybe to a, a person imprisoned by guilt or by shame or by... Um, you know, just, just the regret of a decision they made for someone to walk up and say they forgive them. It's kind of the first sign of hope, the first sign of rescue that something else can be known for them besides just guilt and shame. Many people, I think, struggle with those words, though. The three words that hold a lot of power, but the three words that many of us struggle to say. It's not easy for the heart to release forgiveness. And when it does, sometimes they're all tangled up with a mess of ulterior motives. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but we say, I forgive you, but then we attach it to a condition. Maybe you say something like, I'll forgive you if you do this, or I'll forgive you if this happens. Sorry, I got some more eyeball. Ah. I'll forgive you if, or uh, sometimes it's partial. I forgive you, but I'll never forget what you did, or I'll forgive you, but I'm always going to hold this over you in a way. Sometimes uh, it's delayed. And you'll say something like, I forgive, I will forgive you, but not yet, right? I know I will forgive you eventually, but I'm not ready to do that right now. Forgiving is hard. Forgiving is hard. But honestly, if we don't forgive, we are putting ourselves on a path towards more heartache, towards more pain, towards more discouragement. What begins as some kind of offense to us then leads to resentment. If we don't forgive, it leads to resentment. Then it leads to hatred. Then it leads to a grudge. Then it leads to at the bottom, it kind of bottoms out. I need to take vengeance upon this person. I need to, to do to them what they've done to me. I need to get revenge. There's really only one person that consistently resisted that path of resentment, hatred, grudging, and revenge. There's only one, and it's it's Jesus Christ, the one who forgave completely. Even when he's on the cross and the pressure of the cross and the and the hatred of his enemies who put him there, could not squeeze one ounce of vengeance from the heart of Jesus. When they pounded the nails into his hands, the nails of hatred, what poured out of his veins was not hatred in response, but only love. Right? What was he saying, Luke, Father, forgive them. They don't know, they don't know what they're doing. We're gonna look at a scene from David's life where David faces a really hurtful situation in which he has to decide whether or not he's going to forgive. And in one way, he's going to pass the test with flying colors. But another, he falls short of that example we get in Jesus of perfect forgiveness. For David, though he's a man after God's own heart, David is only human. And in him, we find an example of a man who both succeeded in forgiving and struggled with forgiveness. The story begins in the middle of David's flight from Jerusalem. After Absalom has come to take the throne, David removes himself and is leaving and fleeing Jerusalem. He's just lost the throne to his own son. He's kind of trudging down this dusty road. And with each step, he's grieving. Grieving the loss of his kingdom, grieving the loss of his home, grieving the loss of his, of his family. He's got regret. He's got sorrow. He's got guilt. And into this scene of tragedy enters a vulture of a human being who comes to feed on his disgrace. Second Samuel chapter 16. Let's start in verse number five. And when King David came to Baharim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei. And Shimei, the son of Gera, came forth and cursed at him as he came. He cast stones at David and all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men, which were on his right hand and his left. And thus said Shimei, when he cursed, come out. Come out, you bloody man, thou man of Belial. The Lord hath turned upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead you have reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, you are taken a mischief because you are a bloody man. You're a man of bloodshed. This man is a relative of Saul. He's probably got some kind of a grudge against David for more than at this point, 
20 years since the dynasty shifts hands from Saul's house to, to David's house. His logic is really blurred here by hatred. And he sees David's, the mess that David's in now as some kind of evidence of God's judgment against David for the sin he committed against Saul in his mind. And this is his chance to take some revenge on it, right? To, to celebrate this demise, to throw stones at David, to, to mock his current situation. But his charges are untrue. David didn't murder Saul. He didn't steal Saul's throne. And God didn't give Absalom the throne. Absalom took it, right? So none of the things that uh, Shammai is, is declaring are true. But they're, they're accus uh, accusations regardless. And sometimes no, no other offense plunges deeper. Maybe it's my, just my personality. But nothing hurts me more than a false accusation. Right there, there's there's a sting to that. There's a there's a pain to that when they're especially when they're hurled at us when we're vulnerable, when we're going through some kind of a of a difficult situation for someone to just chuck an an untrue accusation from us, just chuck a you know I call them a, a cheap shot from the cheap seats, right? Where people just can say whatever they're gonna say, and this guy's just literally watching the king walk down the road, and he's taking these cheap shots from the cheap sheets, cheap seats. He's 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 mocking him. He's making fun of him. He's he's accusing him. And right here, one of David's right-hand men is going to not stand for this. His name is Abishai. We're going to see read that in verse number, verse number nine. Then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. The furthest thing from Abishai's mind at this point is forgiveness. He's not thinking, oh, David, let's be patient. David, let's, this guy's probably had a hard day. You know, just imagine that you were out of the house of Saul. No, he says, why should this dead dog curse you? Just snap your fingers, David, and I'll go chop his head off, is what he's saying. Like, just give me one, one look, and I will go annihilate this guy. David chooses to fix his eyes on God instead of the accuser. All these hailstorm of lies... That, that Shemai has thrown at David, there's one statement that penetrates David's conscience. David is a man of bloodshed. David is a bloody man. He has killed, not Saul, he killed Uriah. David begins to think that Shemai's cur curses may be a part of God's discipline for the sin he committed against, against Uriah. So David restrains his warrior, chapter, uh, chapter 16, verse 10. He says, let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, curse David, who shall then say, wherefore hast thou done this? David said to Abishai and all of his servants, behold, my son which came forth of my bowels seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord may have bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and the Lord will requite me good for his cursing in the day. So David and his men went by the way, and Shemai went along on the hillside and were against him and cursed as he went threw stones at him, and cast dust at him. So David says, hey, who knows? If I've, if I've gone through this, this terrible thing of my son taking my throne, who cares about this guy? Like, maybe, maybe God even sent him, he says, to punish me for the, all the bloodshed I have done. So as David and his men are just walking down the road, imagine there's a little hillside on the other side of the, on the, other side of the road, and this guy just continues to follow him. Throwing rocks at him, pestering him, annoying him, mocking him. Now, in the days that follow this, the Lord does return good to David. He is going to stop and thwart Absalom's rebellion and mutiny. And he's going to restore David to the throne. So let's skip ahead a little bit, okay? Chapter 19. Chapter 19. The king triumphantly returns to Jerusalem. David is back on the throne and suddenly Mr. Accuser with the stones shows back up singing a different tune. Look at verse number 16 of chapter 19. And Shimei, the son of Gera, Benjamite, which was of Bahurim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him and Ziba, the servants of the house of Saul and his 15 sons and his 20 servants. And they went over Jordan before the king. <laughs> so he shows up back now ready and he's going to say something very different like verse number 19 
And they said unto the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me, or don't consider me guilty. Hmm. Neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to heart. For your servant doth know that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am come the first day of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my Lord, the king. His blasphemies against the Lord's anointed were, they were a capital offense at this point. A fact that good old Abishai points out again. Verse 21. This is, but Abishai, the son of Zariah, answered and said, Shall not this guy be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? Abishai type people delight in the letter of the law. And they delight in watching people get what they deserve. Their advice is always right. He's back. Make him pay. To them, maybe to Abishai, showing mercy would be a sign of weakness. But to David, he's going to show mercy as a sign of strength. Look at verse number 22. David said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah, that ye should this day be adversaries unto me? Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? For do not I know that I am this day king over Israel? Therefore the king said to Shemai, Thou shalt not die. And the king swear unto him. How could David show that level of restraint? Not to kill him. Not to stone him. Not to take off his head. David shows mercy. And he shows mercy and he says, This is going to be the cornerstone, basically, of my kingdom. He says, I am the king over Israel. How does he do this? I think first his focus is on the Lord. He had left Shemai's offense in God's hands. That's what chapter 16, verse 12 says. This is in God's hands. Secondly, he was aware of his own failure. Once he had stood in the shoes of the offender and said to God, I have sinned. Once David stood in the shoes of Shemai saying, I have broken your law. I have broken your commands. And God had forgiven him for crimes much worse than mean words. He had forgiven him for crimes much worse than hurling insults. In reality, how could David not forgive Shemai? As much as I would like that story to end there, unfortunately it doesn't. You'd like it to end with like this really sweet spirit of, of forgiveness still in the air, right? But it doesn't. It finishes years later. 1 Kings chapter 2, I'll go there. This is when David is on his deathbed. He is giving final instructions to his son Solomon, who would be the future king. And David's open hand of forgiveness and mercy towards Shimei begins to tighten into a fist. Look at verse number eight, if you have your Bible. If not, I'll read it to you. And behold, thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of Gera, Benjamin of Aharim, which cursed me with the grievous curse in the day that I went to Mahanim. But he came down to meet me at Jordan. I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Now, Solomon, therefore do not hold him guiltless. If you are a wise man and knowest that thou knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him, but his whorehead bring down to the grave with blood. Where'd the forgiveness go? Where'd the, the sweet spirit go? It's really sad that this, this sweet singer of Israel, King David, concludes his life with revenge on his lips. He says, go find this gray-headed guy at this point. Go find him and bring him down to blood. I think it's important for us to see, as great as a man as David was, as great an example in many things that David was, as great a king as he was, he was still very much human. Uh, one of my favorite commentators on this is named Alexander White. I want to... I'm going to read this for you really quick out of his commentary. He says, David, at his best, as at his worst, is one of us. David is a man of like passions with ourselves. David was cut out of the same web, and he was shaped out of the same substance as we are. He was a man of like passions with us. And like our passions, his were sometimes at his heel, but more often at his throat. David held back his bad passions at Saul and at Shemai and at Joab, occasion after occasion, Till we were almost worshiping David. But all the time, and all unknown to us, they were there. Till of all times and of all places in the world, David's banked up revenge passions burst out on his deathbed. 
Why? I believe it's that no flesh may glory in the presence of God. David isn't the perfect example of forgiveness. David's experience shows us here how hard this is to really forgive. I think it's also a good warning for us to keep a watch over our hearts for these seeds that sprout of resentment. And you may have told someone that you forgave them. You may have told someone that it's okay. And as far as they know, you and them are cool. But like David, you have a seed of resentment continuing to grow in your heart. I just want to give us three or four ways to kind of give us some kind of practical suggestions on this to help you stop at the offense level before it grows to revenge. First, Christians, I want to say this as kindly as I can, we've got to develop a thicker layer of skin. A thicker layer of skin. We can become so sensitive so sensitive to criticism that we worry about every little comment that someone makes about us. Well, they said this, or they said that, and it's just an offhand, slight little pinprick that does incredibly mortal wounds to some of our self-esteem. Like these tiny little words of offense that just wreck us. We need to ask the Lord to give us tougher skin, to make us confident enough in Him that we can ignore comments and criticisms that we know aren't true. I had a, a pastor friend of mine who talks about the longer, um, you know, for pastors to be able to stay in ministry for a long time and continue to pastor, you go from a soft skin and a tough heart early in ministry as you grow and as you are in it for a long time, you pray that God gives you a soft heart and tough skin. It's got to be developed over time where you're able to take the comments, where you can take criticisms from your employer, where you can take criticisms from, from your spouse, your kids, and they don't just ruin you. We need to pray for tougher skin. Secondly, try to understand where your offender's coming from. Look beyond the offense to the hurting person that's lashing out. Someone who is insulting, someone who is divisive, someone who's lashing out at you. Look beyond what they're saying to the person that is saying it. People don't always mean what they say. I don't know if you knew that or not. They don't always mean what they say. We may just happen to be a easy target, a convenient target for their pent up anger and frustrations. And you just happened to cross them on the wrong day. When you hear negativity or you hear insults, or you hear wounds and you respond by showing love and concern for the person who is hurting you, we can help them see the real issue. And I think that's when we can turn a really hurtful situation into a healing one where they're coming at you with accusation and insult and, and, and anger. And you see the person behind that and what is going on in this person's life where they feel the need to say this, what kind of pain are they going through where they feel this level of anger and vitriol and emotion. And when you can care for the person who is throwing these comments at you, that's a path towards healing. So we develop a thicker layer of skin. We try to understand where this person is coming from with these accusations. Third, we remember the times in our lives where we needed forgiveness. Colossians 3 says, just as God forgives you, we forgive others. I think the best forgivers in the world are made up of the people who have been most forgiven. Remember when I was in a position where I needed forgiveness. And then finally, openly declare forgiveness and move on. The words, I forgive you, are the best therapy that many of you need for both the offender and the offended. If you've been offended, free yourself and the one who's hurt you with this, this verbal gift of peace. And I think it's important that once that verbal gift is given, that the heart work is happening as well. That we don't forgive, but remember. We don't forgive, but hold tight. We don't forgive, but grow bitter. Psalm 103 says, praise God that he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth and as far as the east is from the west, so great is his loving kindness for us. So far has he removed our, trans uh, our transgressions from us. How does he do that? Because the Lord has compassion on us. Why? Because he knows who we are, says. He's aware that we're dust. He knows us. So how do we move forward with forgiveness? I think we develop tougher skin so we're not as easily offended. We try to understand where this offender is coming from. 
We recall times in our lives where we needed to be forgiven. And then finally, we just declare it and move, move forward. God can do many things for you. He can help you heal your hurt. He can help you heal the wounds that you've gone through. But there's one thing that he doesn't do. He doesn't remove our past. To forgive someone doesn't mean we have to forget the offense entirely. It's impossible okay, for us to do that. Forgetting has more to do with restoring an injured relationship. With allowing the pain to kind of subside to a point where it doesn't ache whenever you see that person that's wounded you or hurt you. It's learned to trust again. I think it's important for us to know that forgiveness is not a snap of the fingers kind of miracle. It's a journey that involves work and commitment and faith and time. But the God of forgiveness can help us to walk this path so we don't end up in our deathbed. Looking back at all the people we've forgiven and angry about how they didn't get what they deserved. Let's uh, have a word of prayer and then I want to recap some of the announcements, okay? Lord, we love you. We have the opportunity to get us to study your word this evening. I thank you for this, this just this chapter from David's story. Uh, Lord, we see such an incredible picture of faith and trust to forgive, but Lord, also the side of it where years down the road, if it's not properly dealt with and and relationships healed, how that bitterness can always spring up at later years. I pray to help us to be disciplined. I pray to help us to be people who are difficult to offend. And then when people hurt us or accuse us, they, we'd be quick to put ourselves in their shoes, that we'd be quick to remember when we needed forgiveness. We'd be looking to bless and help those who are hurting, or the Bible says, despitefully using us. I pray to help us to be quick forgivers and that we'd be faithful in the long journey that follows after that, that moment of forgiveness to continue to fight out, uh, root out those roots of bitterness in our heart. I pray to help us to be a church of people who are tough to offend. And when we are offended, we are quick to forgive. I pray to help us to grow in these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so Sunday. Okay, Sunday. 9.30 and 11. The Stokes will be in both services. Okay, so we'd love for you to be able to come out and meet them as they uh, tell us more about their, their mission work in Vanuatu. Excuse me. And then Sunday night, 5 p.m. Sunday night, 5 p.m. Be there. Okay, so... Come out, bring uh, some finger foods or whatever you'd like to bring for the, the kind of potluck style. Don't come thinking you're going to feast, okay? We're not, this is, you know, don't don't worry. Don't put yourself kind of pressure on that. We're kind of making a little bit lighter uh, of a meal just so we can um, be able to get into the service a little bit quicker and enjoy some time afterwards as well. So bring out something that, that you can share together and then we'll jump into a time of worship that I really think you're going to enjoy on Sunday evening. Uh, so coming out and be a part of it. And then Pastor Justin should have posted, if you haven't yet, let's put it in there now, Justin, the... Uh, the comment on the uh, VBS workers form. Okay. Well, if I can help you, let me know. Send us a message. We hope you guys have a great rest of your week. And uh, God bless, guys. We love you. And we hope to see you Sunday. You're dismissed. Mm-hmm.